Would you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17 tonight? Thank you again, graduates, for your faithfulness, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to honor you uh, tonight. I heard a story uh, a number of years ago of a guy who lived out in California. This uh, gentleman, he one day he decided to go get his lawn chair and put it out in the front yard. He put his lawn chair out in the front yard and he took some rope and he tied some rope around his lawn chair and staked it to the ground. And Then he went in and he got a bunch of supplies ready. He got a pack of lunch and, and he got his BB gun, got a little knife and um, got some weather balloons. And he took and he tied those weather balloons to his lawn chair and he uh, went out there and got, sat in his chair once he had all the supplies and he took his knife out and he cut the rope holding his lawn chair down and up he went, riding his lawn chair, air, airplane I guess, what do you call it, hot air balloon. And, and he rode that lawn chair up into the sky and he ascended higher and higher and higher and higher so high that he actually got into the flight patterns for LAX airport in Los Angeles and uh, they, the helicopters went up the news media went up trying to check out this guy floating in the sky on his lawn chair <laughs> finally uh, he, he decided he was he realized he was getting close to the Pacific Ocean and so they he tried to, to, to start landing he started shooting out his uh, his, 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 uh, his, uh, his weather balloons, one by one, trying to slowly descend, but it was already too late. He got into the, whatever, I guess the jet stream you call it, and it swept him out to sea. And they followed him there, sent a boat out to, uh, finally he got lower and lower and lower, and he, as the day got later and later and later, and he'd only packed a lunch, and <laughs> he got hungrier and hungrier, and it got darker and darker, and he slowly descended, and finally he landed in the Pacific Ocean, where a boat had picked him up, and they went and they interviewed and they say, why in the world did you do that? What were you doing? What were you thinking riding this lawn chair balloon out into the sky? And here's the response. He said, well, I can't just sit around. I guess that's a good excuse to go do that, right? And that is true. We can't just sit around, can we, sometimes? Uh, you know what? I don't believe that our graduates from the class of 2013 are going to be a group that just wants to sit around. I believe they want to do something. I believe they want to change the world. You know, as I listen to speech after speech of, uh, of valedictorians of, and graduations past, that's the theme all the time is, is they believe, they really believe that they can change the world. They believe that their class can be a generation of young people that can impact this world for years to come. Let me ask you tonight, are you content to just go through the motions? Or do you want to make an impact on the next generation? How will you be remembered? How do you want to be remembered? Or will you even be remembered at all? See, there's people who watch things happen in life. There's people who make things happen in life. And then there's people who don't really know what's happening in life. And the question tonight is, who will you be? Will you be a world changer for Christ? I read a story a number of years ago of a, of a man named Joshua Chamberlain. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain was leading the 20th Maine, is in the state of Maine. They were called on to defend a hill named Little Round Top during the Battle of Gettysburg in the Civil War. They knew the situation was of vast importance and some historians claim that if the 20th Maine were not able to defend Little Round Top, the Union would have gone on to lose the Civil War. That's how important it was. See, the 15th Alabama Infantry Regiment was constantly attacking them there as they were trying to hold their position on the top of the Little Big Top. After sustaining serious casualties and with ammunition running seriously low, Colonel Chamberlain knew he had one last option. And as he stood there, with, uh, sat there in the bunker with bullets whizzing past him, he fixed his bayonet on the end of his rifle, and he made the call for a bayonet charge for all of his troops. And he jumped over the wall and started running downhill toward the enemy. Now they tell us after the fact that there is no way that all of his men 
could have heard him. They were spread so thin along the line there as they defended the bunker there uh, on, the, on, the, uh, at the, on the little round top hill. But they say that, they, that his men, the only way they could have known is they had to have seen Colonel Chamberlain jump to his feet and to see him jump over the hill and, or jump over the bunker and start charging downhill with his, uh, with his rifle and bayonet ready to fight the enemy. And his troops, they responded. And they took off and they ran down the hill. And without really planning, they actually flanked the enemy in an amazing way. And they ended up capturing just the small group of people that were with them. They captured the enemy there that was at the bottom of the hill that had them outnumbered in an amazing way. They ended up capturing 101 of the enemy, and they successfully defended their position. You know, Joshua Chamberlain went on to become a general, and later he became the governor of Maine. But he is remembered forever for that day on Little Round Top when he sealed the Battle of Gettysburg all because he decided to make something happen. He decided that day that he was going to be a world changer. You know, I could tell you story after story of heroic men and women throughout history. But tonight I want to share with you one account from the Word of God of some world changers here in the Bible. In fact, they were such world changers that they turned the world upside down. And that's in the book of Acts and in the 17th chapter. Here Paul is on his second missionary journey with Silas. And they had just left Philippi and on the second missionary journey. And they're now headed to Thessalonica. And we'll pick up reading in Acts chapter 17 and verse number 1. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went into them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that, his, that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out unto the people. And when they found them not, they didn't find Paul and Silas, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Here's an amazing uh, account of how Paul and Silas and, and, and how they go into this city of uh, Thessalonica. And here they begin uh, uh, ministering to the people and witnessing in the synagogue. And, and, and a few of the Jews believe. Many uh, Greeks believed. And, and also the number of the chief women, or those who were in the ruling capacity, they believed as well. But unfortunately there were some who didn't believe that day as well. And they set the city in an uproar. And they went and they tried to get uh, Paul and Silas. They couldn't get them because they departed. But they got Jason and they got some of the other Christians. And they made this amazing statement when they got them. They brought them to the rulers of the city and they say, Hey, we have found the ones here who are turning the world upside down. And they're coming to our city too. And they're trying to turn it upside down. What a compliment that was, wasn't it? What a compliment it was and what a truth it was that the Christians were turning the world upside down and that they could not be stopped. And truly, that was the case. If you read back a little further in the book of Acts, you would see how Paul, when he went to, on his first minute missionary journey, he, he went to the city of Lystra, for example. And when he was there in the city of Lystra, if you know what happened, they beat him. They beat him and they left him for dead. But Paul, he got back up and he kept going. And he kept going for the cause of Christ. Christianity could not be stopped. They kept going. In fact, on his second missionary journey, guess where Paul went? One of the first cities he went back to on the second missionary journey. You guessed it. He went back to Lystra. He wasn't going to be stopped. He was going to further the kingdom of God at any cost. And he kept on going there with Silas and Timothy uh, following them as he, he got there to Lystra and ministered there again. He went on next to Philippi. 
He went on to Philippi, and they're in Europe now. He's in Europe, and, and the first convert is saved there in Europe. And amazing things are happening. Uh, Paul gets thrown in jail in Philippi, and the jailer gets saved. Let me tell you today that they couldn't stop the cause of Christ. Christianity was spreading like wildfire. They were turning the world upside down, and they could not stop them. And now, here they are in Thessalonica. And some Jews, again, they got saved. A great multitude of Gentiles, they got saved. Some of the chief women, they got saved. But that wasn't without trouble because they were oppressed on every side by the Jews who did not believe. And they tried and they tried there to stop Christianity. But here, let me tell you, the more and more they tried, the more of the world they turned upside down for Jesus Christ. See, when, the, when, when those Jews in Thessalonica, they were called Christians. They were called uh, world changers. It was not a criticism. They meant it as a criticism. Oh, let me tell you tonight, it was a compliment. Because that, exactly, that was exactly what was going on. Uh, they were, it wasn't just a compliment either. It was the truth. For the word of God was setting the world upside down. And the whole gospel was changing the world. And let me tell you today, that's exactly what the gospel does. It changes the world and it turns it upside down. See, that's because Christianity, it is revolutionary. You can't be silent and sit on the sidelines with Christianity. It's a revolution. Christianity is. In fact, that's the entire purpose of Christianity, isn't it? That's what the gospel is. Jesus Christ came into this world, didn't he? He came into this world that was upside down. That was in destruction. And what did Jesus do? He came and he gave his life as a ransom for many so all could be saved. And he rose from the grave, conquering the world and conquering death. And Jesus Christ, he came and gave his life. Why? To take a world that was upside down and to make it right again. That's what the gospel does. And that's why Jesus came and that's what Christianity is still doing to this day. But unfortunately, Many churches and many Christians are caving into the pressure of the world today, aren't they? It's not easy to stand up for the truth of the Word of God anymore, is it? You know, back in, in years ago, I've, been, I've heard how it was easy. How to, uh, In fact, Pastor referenced it this morning, how uh, when he was in school, they used to read the Bible in school. And, uh, that's foreign to many of us and many generations here today. That's a foreign thought that they would read the Word of God in school. They would pray in school, really? Why? Because... They're trying to overturn Christianity yet again. And unfortunately, many Christians in many churches, they're not, uh, they're not standing up to the pressure. They're giving in and they're caving. And let me tell you today, if there was ever a day where truth needed to be stood for, it is today. And it is possible as well. Did, did Paul have it easy back then? No. They were arrested. We're not arrested today for gathering. Hey, it could get a whole lot worse. And let me tell you today, let me encourage you with this thought here today as, as we get into our message. But as we, I, want to, I want to encourage you with this thought that just because there's opposition, that doesn't mean that God is absent. Do you know that? Sometimes when there is opposition in the world, that means that God is about to do something miraculous and something amazing. And today, could God be setting up this world right now for an amazing revival? Could he? There was an amazing revival that was going on. They could not stop Christianity back in Paul's day, even though they were opposed. And let me tell you today, it would be the same today. When we stand up and trust God and believe in Him and obey the Word of God and pray, let me tell you, God will be on our side. And there is no, that can, no one that can be against us when God is for us. Today, will we stand up for the truth again like they did back then? Would we stand up and be world changers in this day and age we live in? The question tonight is, will you be a world changer? Do you want to be a world changer? You know, let me address the graduates here tonight. Graduates, you may be wondering, how can my life count? How can my life count? Make a difference. I mentioned already that many times the theme throughout uh, graduation services is we want to change the world. We want to do something great in our generation. How is the best way that you can impact this world? You know, may, may, maybe many of you, you have dreams and aspirations of being a CEO of a company. 
of, of achieving, achieving greatness in your field of study, maybe being a politician or an inventor that invents a great thing, whatever your dream is today, let me tell you, it is always going to be second when it comes to the cause of Christ. The greatest way you can impact the world isn't through being a CEO or a politician or an inventor or a leader in your field, but by changing the world and turning it upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. That is the greatest way you can affect this generation. The greatest impact you will ever have is for Jesus. Now in this passage, I want to show you three quick things. And as we look at how these Christians... How did they turn the world upside down? How did they do it? How did they take and turn the world upside down? Hey, even the, even the people of the world, they were saying, hey, they're turning the world upside down. We've got to get rid of them. They recognized it. How did they do it? There's three things real quickly I want to share with you. And that these, these things aren't just for our graduates today, by the way. They're for every Christian here today. You can make an impact on this world. The question is, will we? How did those Christians affect the world and turn the world upside down for Christ? First of all, they had a truth that changes lives. They had a truth that changes lives. If you remember there in our text how Paul, he went there into the synagogue. What did he do? He reasoned with them out of the scriptures, didn't he? He reasoned with them. That wasn't a speech or a script he was reading. It was a conversation. It was a debate he was having with those people. Again, it wasn't a script. It was a message that he knew from his heart. That he took that message that was burning in his heart. And he took it and he shared it with dying people. Giving them life. You know the word of God has the power to transform lives today like it did back in Paul's day. It has the same power today to transform lives. You know, so many of us in our audience today, as I look around, you could stand up and you could give testimony. I know your testimonies. I've heard it. Of what God has done in your life and some of the great things that He's done. How you're not the person that you once were. Why? All because of Jesus. Not because of your great ability to overcome. No, but because of what Jesus has done inside of your life. He saved you and He has changed your life through the power of the truth of the Word of God that you've heard and that you have believed See, that's what the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God, it changes lives. And that's what Paul had back in that day. He had the Word of God that brings conviction and that sheds lights on hearts. The Word of God is a light, the Bible says. It's a hammer and it's a sword that changes people from the inside out. You know, the Word of God, it sets people free. It sets people free. Today you may have been set free by the word of God and the truth that's there. I've been set free by the word of God. Jesus has changed my life forever and I will never be the same. You know, I could wander back and go back to the old world and my old life, but you know what? I will never be satisfied. Why? Because Jesus has changed me. You know, the word of God, it can change you and it can change other people in this world today. Again, the truth sets people free, but only through friction. There's a friction through the word of God, isn't it? You know, Jesus is teaching. Think about Jesus' is teaching. Jesus, he was always interested in the heart, wasn't he? That was different. That's something new they hadn't heard before. Jesus told the people when he came that the servant is greatest in the kingdom of God. Jesus said that the meek would inherit the earth. Jesus said that there was a king who was going to give his life for his people. That's the exact opposite of everything we've ever learned. Right there, it was a friction at that time, there was a friction to what Jesus taught. And there's a friction to the word of God today. It contradicts the world systems. It goes against the world. It goes against our flesh. And it goes against sin. But let me tell you, that friction will set you free if you'll put your faith and trust in it today. If you just believe it. If you just follow it and obey it, it'll set you free. And that is the message. The word of God is what the world needs at this hour. It doesn't need my opinion. It doesn't need your opinion. But the world needs the word of God and the truth that's there. Paul knew the truth. He knew it. He was able to reason with them. But do you know the truth? Do you know the truth? See, tonight as we look at the truth that changes lives, I want to ask you a few questions at first. Is it changing you? 
Is it changing you? We know the Word of God does change lives, but is it changing you tonight? 1 Peter 2, 1 through 2 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guilt and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. You know, so often we read that verse number 2, but we never read verse number 1. See, as we're growing in the Word of God and the Word of God is changing our life, we're laying aside malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. See, why? The Word of God, it changes us. Is it changing you? See, the sad truth today is you may, be, you may want from your heart to be a world changer. You might want to affect the world for the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you today, you can't change a world with a gospel that you aren't being changed by. If the gospel isn't changing you, you can't change the world by that gospel, can you? Is the gospel changing you? Is the word of God changing you? Is it in you? Is the word of God in you today? Paul Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God was in him. And that's why he was able to go and reason with me. Is the word of God in you to take to a world that needs it? Is it working through you? James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Is the truth of the Word of God coming through and affecting your actions? And is it coming out of you? Are you taking the truth you know and telling it to other people? 2 Timothy 2.2 says, And the things that thou hast heard among me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This book that we hold in our hands today, it is the truth that has changed this world for centuries and in thousands of years. It's, it's gone on and on and on since the beginning of time. The Word of God has changed lives. It is the truth that changes lives. But today, is it in you? Is it, or is it changing you? Is it working through you? Is it coming out of you? Will you be a world changer through the truth of the Word of God? I thought of a second thing that was here in this passage that I want to look at. How did they, those Christians, how did they turn the world upside down? Secondly, they had a heart for personal ministry. They had a heart for personal ministry. I want to show you just a couple passages. Actually, just right there in our text. We'll just look at this one here. Uh, Look at uh, verses uh, 2 through 4. It says, And Paul, as his manner was, went into them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed. As we read that part. Paul was involved in personal ministry. Paul had a heart for personal ministry. And today, if we want to turn the world upside down, it's going to be through personal ministry. Where we get involved in the lives of people. You know, that's not always so popular. That's where growth and discipleship happens, though. It's where ministry gets dirty. It's where uh, it gets uh, dirty and it gets personal. It gets time-consuming. And it gets transparent. When we engage others on a personal level with the Word of God, as we disciple them, as we minister to them, as we teach them, and as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. But let me tell you, no, tonight it's not only the scary part of ministry, it's also the exciting part of ministry. See, that's where friendships are formed that this world can't take away. That's where friendships are formed in a miraculous way. It's where others grow in the faith in the most miraculous way, where God moves in lives and in hearts and where people change. And the reason why we're a church here today is because there's a whole bunch of people that decided to engage in personal ministry with other people. But you know, we need another generation of people in Bible Baptist Church who will stand up and say, hey, I will engage in personal ministry. I will disciple people. I will teach them. I will minister to them. I'll be transparent with them and I'll pray with them and work with them slowly through the process of discipleship and through Christian growth. Will you do that today? 
unfortunately, many people, they would rather go to the light church, the L-I-T-E church. You know, I heard the light church, L-I-T-E church, it had an advertisement up recently. They were advertising 24% fewer commitments that they ask of their people. They were the home of the 7.5% tithe, home of the 15-minute message, the 45-minute service, and they only had eight commandments. You get to pick which ones you want. It's everything you've always wanted in a church and less. That's what many people want today in a church, but let me tell you, that's not the kind of church that affects this world and that changes this world. The church, what is the church? The church is me, it's you, it's all of us engaging in ministry all around this community and all around this world as we engage other people one-on-one and group by group as we lead them to the Lord, as we disciple them in the truth of the Word of God. Tonight, do you have a heart for personal ministry? You know, this hits home tonight because our graduates here are soon going to be leaving the youth ministry in some ways, and I'll mention that in a second. But unfortunately, there's not a college ministry for them to go to here in our church, is there? That's why, actually, I say that soon the teens will be leaving, but they're not leaving because I let them stay. Because why? Because I want something for them still. See, it takes a lot of work to engage in personal ministry. It takes a lot of sacrifice to engage in people and disciple. We we need more discipleship here at our church. We we need more teen teachers. We need uh, more. Pastor mentioned, I counted up the other day, some of the the number of young couples in our class and in our church. And I know Brother Danny and Miss Sue minister to them faithfully. But man, that could be two or three classes. If really, if we wanted to minister to all of them, there's there's, there's 50 of them. But that requires somebody to give of themselves and say, you know what? I will sacrifice my time, I will sacrifice myself, and I will engage in personal ministry with people. That's what changes the world. Do you have the time? Do you have the willingness to do that tonight? And lastly, as we close, I want to share with you the third reason why they were able to turn the world upside down. And that was because they had a faith to stand amidst the conflict. We won't read about it, but in verse 5 it talks about how uh, they, they stood up against the pressure there. Uh, imagine this, this. This blows my mind. I love this. How, how they were dragging Jason and the other Christians out, right? They were dragging them. And then they went they took them before the political leaders and they said, Hey, these guys that turned the world upside down, here they are, and we've arrested a few of them. Now let me ask you, do you think that Jason and the other Christians, do you think they stood a little taller when they heard him say that these are the ones who are turning the world upside down? Hey, that was the wrong thing to say to those Christians, wasn't it? I'm sure Jason heard that. like, hey, yeah, do you hear that? Hey, the word of God works. We're changing the world. They're scared of us. Hey, we're not backing down now. We're going to stand in the midst of the conflict. Don't you think they did that that day? I think they did. You know, this world, it's like a raging river. It's like a raging river. You ever been to a river that is just really moving rapidly and everything that gets in its path, it just takes along with it, except, except. That river looks really smooth. You can tell it's moving fast. But what happens when you put a big, massive rock right in the middle of that river? What happens? What happens? All of a sudden, things get a little turbulent, don't they? (laughs) They get a little rough in that water, don't they? What happens if you put two or three or four rocks in the middle of that raging river? What happens? All of a sudden, the water starts turning white and it starts to get rough, doesn't it? Why? Because whenever there's opposition to a force that strong, it creates some resistance. Let me tell you today, if you will stand by faith for Jesus Christ and live your life according to the Word of God, you will make waves in this world. Because why? Because the world is pushing on. The world system is moving on, doing everything. They're dragging everybody its way and on the way. But Christians are still standing in the gap and standing and resisting the world and resisting the devil. And whenever they do, they're going to make waves and there will be conflict. See, this world, it doesn't like holiness. The world doesn't like the fact that we're gathering here today in Jesus' name. They don't like that. Let me tell you, we've got to stand for the truth of the Word of God. We've got to stand for the truth, and we, uh, we've got to live holy lives, even though they don't like it. You know, sometimes we don't like that, too. 
As soon as we see somebody else doing better than we are, what's, what's the first reaction in our flesh? Is it to compliment and to cheer them on? No, we want to tear them down, don't we? I do. I don't know about you. Sometimes in my flesh. You ever felt that way before? Why? Because this flesh, it can't stand somebody looking better than us. It can't stand holiness. But oh, let me tell you, but those holy lives live for the example of Jesus Christ. They make an impact on this world. And they will change this world for the cause of Christ. The question is tonight, will you stand? Graduates, you're entering a harsh new world in just a little while. You're going to be going to college. You know, Rockcastle County High School, we're blessed with a lot of great teachers who, who, uh, who are Christians. Uh, you, you get a lot of good Christian influence still at our public high school here in this county. I praise God for that. But when you go to college, you're not going to see that same thing. And you're going to face a new world of, uh, of difficulties. And you're going to need faith to stand amidst the conflict. Will you stand? I want to share this with you as we close tonight. In 1961... 25 students drew up a Christian manifesto for world evangelism. These are students. They wrote this. Literal adherence to the principles laid down by Jesus Christ would never, without a doubt, result in worldwide revolution. A revolution motivated by love, a revolution executed by love, and a revolution culminating in love. And we are revolutionaries. We are only a small group of Christian young people. Yet we have determined by God's grace to live our lives according to the revolutionary teachings of our Master, Jesus Christ. Within the sphere of absolute, literal obedience to His commands lies the power that will evangelize the world. Outside this sphere is the nauseating, insepid Christianity of our day. We have committed ourselves in reckless abandonment to the claims of Christ on our blood-bought lives. We have no rights Every petty personal desire must be subordinated to the supreme task of reaching the world for Christ. We are debtors. We must not allow ourselves to be swept into the soul-binding curse of modern-day materialistic thinking and living. Christians have been willing long enough to forsake all. The time has come and is passing when we must forsake all. Christ must have absolute control of our time and money. We must yield our possessions, comforts, food, and sleep. We must live on the barest essentials that His cause might be furthered. The propagation of the faith we hold supreme. Christ is worthy of our all. And we must be ready to suffer for Him and count it joy. To die for Him and to count it gain. In the light of the present spiritual warfare, anything less than absolute dedication must be considered insubordination to our master and mockery of this cause. This is our commitment. And we will press forward until every person has heard the gospel. We will soon be in many different countries engaged in combat with all the forces of darkness. We look beyond the thousands to the millions, beyond the cities to the countries, and the world is our goal. And our primary targets are the seemingly impenetrable areas of the communist and Muslim countries which can only receive freedom as they have opportunity to receive the truth of Jesus Christ. These countries will be reached for Christ no matter what the cost. The ultimate victory is ours. Isn't that powerful? You know, we need today to be a church that will stand up like those 25 young people did in 1961 and say, hey, we are going to go and follow Jesus and we don't care what everybody else does. We're going to take the truth of the Word of God and we're going to engage in personal ministry and we're going to stand for the faith no matter what the cost. No matter who stands up against us, we are going to stand for Jesus. Today I challenge you graduates and I challenge you church, will you be a group that stands and makes the greatest impact that anybody can ever have in their life. And that is an impact for Jesus Christ. Do you want to turn the world upside down? Do you want to change the world tonight? Here's how. Give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Would you stand? So we have a time of invitation now. We're going to ask you to come. Would you make your way forward right now? Maybe right now, even though right now, you know you need to come right now. God's put something on your heart and you need to bring it before the Lord right this moment. Would you come right now? 
Would you come and say, yes, I'm going to give my all to Jesus. Yes, I'm going to be a world changer. Would you come right now as they begin to play? Would you come right now? Come right now. If God has put something in your heart, you need to make a public decision. Would you come? Today, maybe you need to give your heart to Christ. Maybe you need to make that first step in the Christian faith and say, hey, I'm going to believe in Jesus. You know, I, I've been putting this off for a long time, but today I'm going to become a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died and He rose again, and today I want to put my faith in trust. Would you come and trust Christ as your Savior tonight? Or maybe you've been a Christian for a while, but it's time for you to take that stand again. And you're not going to you don't care what the world does. You're going to resist the world. You're going to be like that rock in the middle of the raging river. And you're going to stand against the forces of evil and live for Jesus when you do that time. Either there in your view or maybe if you need to come forward, you do it right now. Make your way forward. Make the decision. Decide to follow the Lord. No matter what come may make, whatever might come in your life, decide today that you give your life to Jesus and serve Him. Brother Damon, don't be saved. 597. You come right now as they begin to sing. You come right now. Anyway, join our church to make a decision.